Istanbul, Turkey is arguably one of the most significant pictures of our world today. Several years ago, I was in the city and I visited two great structures. The first is known as St. Sophia's Cathedral or Hagia Sophia, the second, the Blue Mosque. Hagia Sophia was built in the sixth century. It was the one of, arguably, the most significant uh, churches in all of Christendom at that time. Chrysostom was a pastor in that church. It was a church that was uh, a place of gathering for people who were serious about their faith. If you look at Istanbul, on one side of the Bosporus Strait is Constantinople, and on the other side was Chalcedon. And if you know your church history and, and some of the creeds that have emerged in the church's traditions, you'll know that those are two very significant locations. And the interesting thing about the Blue Mosque is, is that it stood for centuries, from the 6th century uh, until the 15th century, as a major form and a major place and a major symbol of Christianity. But in the 15th century, the Turks, uh, who had uh, been trying to overtake Constantinople, finally achieved it and sacked the city of Constantinople. And almost immediately, the crosses of St. Sophia's were desecrated. The city was taken over, and as with many churches, uh, across the Byzantine uh, Empire, they were immediately converted to mosques, and so it was. And then nearly 500 years later, in 1935, as part of a reformer of uh, the reformer uh, Kemal Ataturk, uh, his drive to modernize Turkey, he turned it into a museum. And uh, you can make jokes about central city cathedrals being more museums than anything else. I, I have a friend who pastors a city, sitter, city center cathedral. Don't say that quickly. You could be in trouble. Um, anyway, he pastors that, and his problem is, is that his congregation is getting older and older and older and older, and eventually um, it really does look like a museum. And one of the dangers that we all feel and sense is, is that, oh, well, we'll let them go. But there's something about the symbolism of having a structure that points to God and to Christ in the center of a major urban center that, that is important to all of us. So on the one hand, you had St. Sophia's. I went through it carefully, and I noticed how they were reconstruction, reconstructing some of the uh, archways and some of the paintings were being restored. It was really quite a beautiful thing. And then just a few hundred meters away, I went to the Blue Mosque. And the Blue Mosque was built in 1609, uh, went from 1609 to 1616, by Sultan Ahmed I. So it was intended to be, in a sense, the opposite to that cathedral, and if you will, a kind of a competitive structure. It was built by an architect who gave it great attention to the tile work, which is deep blue, and the, and the domes and the sub-domes, and six minarets, which was unique at the time. It's just a unique structure. And so I went into that, and I looked, and I wasn't able to go right inside, but the blue carpeting and all of it was just beautiful two beautiful structures. But the irony came when I walked between the two. I walked from Hagia Sophia to the Blue Mosque, and as I did, I was confronted, as many of us have been in cities around the world, by people trying to sell me things. And so the first guy came up to me and said, we have Turkish carpet. The next guy said, we're cheaper than Kmart. Another guy said, we have Starbucks. And finally, the last person, and I'm sure he was taught this by a Wheaton short-termer, said, let me rip you off. And that was kind of the, the kind of groundwork between the two. It was a kind of marketplace that was in full gear. And this is a picture of what we face in the interreligious world today. Historic traditions, strong structures, and a kind of business as usual in between. The problem with this scenario is that it's very complex, and the business is open, but it's challenging. So I want to I lean into that a little bit more today. Before we do, one of the approaches that I'd like to highlight is what one of my colleagues calls convicted civility. Martin Marty um, used the term. He said, there are many people who are people of conviction, but they have very little civility. 
There are other people who have a lot of civility, but they seem to have no conviction. What we need, he said, is convicted civility. Now, my colleague Richard Mao wrote a book called Uncommon Decency, and I would recommend that to you, Uncommon Decency. I went to the bookstore yesterday to buy the only copy that they had, and they couldn't find it. So if one of you have it, you may want to return it and pay for it. Um, or probably you don't have it, because this is Wheaton. But um, anyway, the, the, the book is an interesting book, because what he does is he, he, he introduces us to the question of how do we act Christianly toward other people while disagreeing? That's a big challenge, a huge challenge, and one that we need to keep in our mind. As we build on that convicted civility, we also have to recognize and remember that part of the issue is the challenge of relating to other people as human beings. One of the most remarkable things I've ever witnessed in my life is the birth of my daughters. I got to watch all three. There's something about the coming out of life and particularly when it's a life that you love so much. And now my daughter's, my youngest is 30, so they're, um, they're, they're adults now. But just watching those children born. And that process happens over and over and over and over and over. And if you watch the world time clock, it's even faster than that. When I was born, the population of the world was 2.5 billion. Today it's 6.5 billion. It's pretty serious growth because I'm not that old. I may look it, but I'm not. And the interesting thing about that growth is the majority of that growth is not happening with people in Wheaton. The majority of that growth is in places around the world. Yesterday I pointed out that 81% of the world's population belonged to four separate religions, the largest of which is Christianity. There was a time when people were worried that Christianity was falling behind and in fact, in fact, shrinking in size, but that's simply not true. It, the, the, the studies show that, in fact, it's growing faster at almost just a little over 2% per year compared to Islam, which is at about 1.6. So you've got, a, you've got a rapid growth. Now, situationally or contextually, it may be growing faster. For example, Islam in Europe is one of the fastest growing faiths, the fastest growing faith in many ways. And what you have is kind of dimensions of that but it's hooked to what I pointed out yesterday, migration and migration patterns. For example, for a while in the United States, Boston was the center of Roman Catholicism, and it was primarily uh, Irish and Northern European. Today, the center of North American Catholicism is Los Angeles, and it's primarily Hispanic. Cardinal Mahoney was at our campus not long ago and talking about it, talking about the new cathedral and all of the growth in the church, and it was remarkable. But that's not just there. In fact, in Aurora, Illinois, just close by, I was doing a study with some of my graduate students here when I was a professor, and we, we were doing research on churches, and we discovered that, that the largest single church there was actually a Catholic church that had, at the time, over 12,000 people that went through it. That's a large church for a city of 110,000 people. So you've got a kind of demographic shift that's taking place. One of the things that shocked me most is how that is actually affecting the landscape of the world. I was in Oxford, and I went to the Statue of the Martyrs. Many of you have perhaps been in Oxford, and it's very close. If you're a C.S. Lewis fan, it's very close to the Eagle and Child pub, which is where he and, uh, and others would gather. And I was standing there, and I looked up at these huge cranes that were doing construction just up the road, and I said, what is that? And my colleague said, that's the largest mosque in northern Europe, and it's being built just close by. So the demographics in the landscape is changing. I made the point yesterday that that calls us as Christians, compels us, out of love for neighbor, to talk to people, to engage with them. So I'd like to weigh into that a little bit this morning, and I'd like to do it, uh, but one more thing. I also used the term evangelical yesterday. And if you are like many of my students, you are not as inclined to want to be pigeonholed or categorized by terms like evangelical. And I can understand that. But before I give you permission to encourage you to do that, let me just remind you that when you are in interfaith conversations, you have a label. You didn't choose it. It was chosen for you by the person who's talking to you. And if they're referring to you as Christian in the broadest sense, they could be thinking that you're all kinds of stripes of Christian. For example, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They could see that as Christian. 
universalist church. They could see that as Christian. Very liberal groups that have no commitment at all to the, to the historic Jesus, to the, to the virgin birth, to the death and resurrection. And so the label that you are given is one that needs to be instructive. So I have chosen in my interactions globally and with people of leaders of other faith to be identified as an evangelical Christian because of those hallmarks that I pointed out yesterday. We're Christ-centered. We're conversionists. We believe in a personal relationship. We're committed to the scriptures, and we're activists. And we are activists. And one of the things that I'd like to help you with today is how does that activism work out in interfaith work? One last point of a kind of preparation. If you're not going to take that particular label, then it's important for you in the conversation to spell out who you are. And the wonderful historic motto of Wheaton College is for Christ and his kingdom. So claiming to be a follower of Christ, detaching yourself from other labels is an appropriate thing to do as long as you remember what that means to you and what that means in the conversation. Now, it's interesting, as we, as we look at this, there are people who have done that. There's a group called The Fellowship, perhaps you've heard of them, that are very active in Washington, D.C. Doug Coe happens to be the head of that. And they have a powerful ministry. And they have chosen not to affiliate with the church or to be called Christians. They're called the family of Jesus. They refer to themselves as, as followers of Jesus. I was at the prayer breakfast in 2006. Some of you might remember that was a remarkable prayer breakfast because the speaker was Bono, and I know he's been here as well. It was the first time in a major national gathering that I had seen a speaker wear a leather jacket and an open shirt. He looked really cool. And everybody else on the podium just kind of faded away compared to him. The other thing is he had on those yellow glasses, so I'm not sure, you know, what he was seeing. But anyway, he was powerful. But the interesting thing is after that, at lunchtime, the king of Jordan was asked to speak. Um, and uh, as he did that, King, king Abdullah II, he talked about his work as a maker of peace. The king of Jordan sits in a very interesting position between Iraq and Israel between Syria and Iraq, Kurds to the north. He's surrounded by an area that is full of turmoil. And his commitment is a commitment of peace. He's a com committed Muslim. And, and as he worked and shared, he shared about his commitment to peace. Now, his cousin, who spoke at Yale when I attended that ceremony some time ago, introduced his talk by saying, if we don't get this right, we're going to kill each other. So let's start talking about things that will bring us together. That's the stakes at which we see this on a global stage. And so he, he, he spoke, but it was interesting. After he spoke, he met with a group of religious leaders. They went in the back room. And just as they finished speaking, uh, his bodyguards came in and were going to usher him out to another meeting. And an old rabbi who was in the gathering said, King Abdullah, uh, can I pray for you? And my colleague who was in the room said there was a kind of a hush, went across the room for a minute, having a Jew, Jewish rabbi pray for a, 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 a Muslim king uh, from the Middle East. And he said, may I pray for you? And he said, yeah. He said, King Abdullah, we all need you. And we want to pray that God will protect you. And so he prayed for him. And my colleague said afterwards, I think God was pleased. Now that might rattle some of your cages a little bit. It did mine a little bit. But the reality is we are seeking after God's intervention. Now, tomorrow we'll talk a little bit about the theological bind that that puts us in. But that commitment to work in the name of Jesus, to, to push away labels, is a worthy commitment, but one that you need to guard carefully and watch. Let's move on. One of the things that we see historically that God has done in reaching people is God reaches people where they are. Andrew Walls, the great mission historian and church historian, wrote that this tendency is what he calls the indigenizing principle. That is, God comes to us where we are. And if God comes to us where we are, that means he accepts us where we are. We don't prepare ourselves in order to be met by God where we want him to meet us. I don't know where you met God. Some of you would have been at the knee of your mother or father, and I give thanks for that. My daughter's found the Lord that way, but it didn't happen that way with me. I was a rebellious person. I was sent away to military school and high school, and if you know 
what kids are like that get sent away to military school. Most of us either are not liked by our parents or we're incorrigible, and I think I might have had a little bit of a 50-50 on that one. So anyway, I went off to military school, and I got out of military school, and I was headed for the U.S. Army, and I was, I was excited about that. I, I, I felt committed to that. I met my wife at the time. She was just a young woman in the church that my uh, father's partner was working in, so I met her, and she led me to the Lord. It was a very transforming experience. But the interesting thing is, God came to me with all of my four-letter expletives. I could get through about two sentences without an expletive in those days. I was angry a lot of the time, and I had no what I thought were redeemable qualities. But God met me where I was. That was Thanksgiving, 1969, and I haven't looked back since. Uh, so I don't know where you were. But God meets each of us and when he does, he meets us where we are. That includes the social networks, that includes the belief systems, that includes the cultural pers perspectives. And one of the things that we dare not do is to presuppose God's activity in the life of another person. And one of the dangers you have when you categorize another religious group is that you immediately say, God can't do anything in you. He's working exclusively with me. That's a dangerous assumption because we believe that God is active through the Spirit in the world. We believe that God is, God is in control. And one of the things that we afford ourselves the opportunity to do is to be a witness in that process of God's work in relationship with other people. And that becomes an important part. We'll touch on that in terms of evangelism tomorrow. But God comes to us where we are. And that means where you are in your faith journey, in your tradition. So let's, let's look at this briefly. How do, we, how, how do we think about this? I want to think about it very quickly in three categories, and I'll get you out of here on time. The first is listening. The second is speaking, and the third is hospitality, listening. If we're going to operate on the basis of convicted civility, we need to think about listening. Now, listening is a problem. T.S. Eliot described the typical family and their ability to listen in this way. Two people who know they do not understand each other, breeding children whom they do not understand and who will never understand them. I don't know if Eliot was right in that. Perhaps he could have been, but the point is listening isn't easy. I was on a missionary team. I was the leader, and we had four of us on this team. Three of them were very active preachers, and we used to watch them talk to each other. And what they did, one would talk, and the other would listen only insofar as they looked like they were listening, but in their minds, they were putting together their message. And so what was happening is they were just talking sort of sequentially. It was a sequential monologue rather than a, a dialogue or a conversation. And that happens with a lot of us. If you're going to listen, you've got to ask questions. And one of the principal ways to begin the work of reaching out to people of other faiths is to ask them what they believe. What they believe about God or what they believe about pain or suffering or what they believe about, about the reason for being. Questions like that can elicit lots of conversations. I have found particularly with Muslim leaders and with Jewish leaders, those questions will keep you talking all day long. And many of you would have attended last night's session. Unfortunately, I couldn't. I had to attend another uh, gathering. But I understand it went very well and was two very articulate spokespersons, one for the Christian faith and one for the Muslim faith. But one of the things that I, if I were you, I would ask me two questions. One is, how do I get over my fear of talking and listening to other people? And secondly, I don't know all that much about my faith, so how do I do that? Well, the truth is, if you're listening, it's not what you know, it's your ability to learn. And I don't think any of you could survive Wheaton College without being a decent learner. For six and a half years, I taught here, and every semester, I had some of the brightest students I'd ever met, and they learned well. Not all, but most. And the interesting thing about that is that they were able to learn on all kinds of levels. Um, I have a friend who teaches in the, in the geology department, and he does remarkable work in teaching that, and I've met, I've met geohydrologists who did their undergrad work here, brilliant people, great learners. The same for psychologists and sociologists and mathematicians and business leaders. We do that. And so you know how to learn. So one of the things I'd like to encourage you to do is learn by listening. If you don't know anything about the other religion, in some ways it, it, it suits you well because the conversation will elicit new input. 
And it will also make you ask questions about your faith. One of the things I've found is I've become much more proficient in my own theological framework, much more uh, deeply committed to and have a deeper understanding by virtue of the fact that I have to interact with other people on that particular point or on the points of theology. So it's a, it's a great opportunity. Let me give you an example from a, from, a, from a friend of mine. Her name is Carrie Graham. She was a student at, at Fuller, and she decided to get serious about this. So she invited six people, five, five other people, herself six, from different faith traditions to meet once a week to talk in her apartment. And they just got together and they ate whatever it was that they could eat together, which you'd have to be kind of careful with your cuisine in that direction, but that's okay, you can learn. And so they ate together and they would talk for a couple of hours about all kinds of things. And it was interesting, during that ter- period of time, one of them had a very serious health problem, another had a relationship problem, and she was able to learn how people cope with that. How do you cope with forgiveness if you understand that your actions are everything when it comes to your salvation? If it's a kind of earned position. Or if you don't have the, the element of grace, how do you understand that? So it gave, a, gave an opportunity to interact. Listening. Another thing that's important to remember about listening is that the ninth commandment says, and I quote, Neither shall you bear false witness against your neighbor. One of the problems of not listening to other people is that you attribute belief to them. You let them know what they believe. I used to do that. Mormon missionaries, young people, young, sometimes younger than you are, would come to my door with their white shirts and their, and their, their uh, name tags, and they would be on mission, and I was working in the South Pacific as a missionary. So my best feeling is I wish they would all go to the local velodrome and ride their bikes around that till they dropped over. I just didn't want them. They were, they were a nuisance to us, and I'm confessing now, and I've confessed this to my friends at, at BYU. But the interesting thing about it is I would hit them at the door with all kinds of arguments about why their belief was incorrect. I never once asked them what they believed. And one time I was in Palmyra, New York, which is where Joseph Smith uh, uh, is uh, said to have received the tablets for the Book of Mormon. And as I was there, I was there with a Mormon leader. He himself was a, was a professor at BYU um, in Provo, Utah, brilliant scholar, historian, and we were sitting together in the sacred grove just kind of talking about what it was like to follow somebody who'd received this direct revelation. And I was asking questions about how they understand revelation. <clears throat> and as we interacted together, I, I thought, we have a close enough friendship, I want to push in a little bit. I had all of these sort of stereotypes, particularly about their clothing and the rituals of their clothing. So I began to ask, and he began to talk to me about how when he gets out of bed in the morning, he spends time getting dressed, thinking about how he is clothing himself in a commitment to God. And I started thinking about, wow, I don't do that. I mean, I'm lucky if I think my pants match my shirt. I just don't pay that much attention. But he does. And all of a sudden, I started, I started really listening. And he started framing for me purity and what that meant in his particular faith. By the way, that's an excellent topic to do in interfaith dialogue. Talk about purity. What do you understand as purity and what do others understand as purity? And what you'll find is, is that various religious traditions are very far apart but the world in which we live is common ground. And so you can begin to talk about things like that. So listening becomes important. And don't bear false witness. Listen and hear what people are saying. Speaking. We all love to do that. And it's an, appor- an important and appropriate thing. But when you're in a conversation with someone else, you're not speaking at them. You're speaking with them. So you need to invite questions about your faith. And one of the scary things is you're going to get questions you can't answer. And you know what is a perfectly good answer? I don't really know, but let's get together for coffee next week and I'll have the answer. I've used that so many times and it works well. By the way, just a little digression. If you get in a situation like that and they want you to eat something that you don't really want to eat, maybe you don't understand what that's like. I do. I've eaten all kinds of things, moving, crawling, creeping, out of plants. You wouldn't believe it. But anyway, I finally found out how to get out of that. My colleague who's an anthropologist said, here's what you say. My mother never taught me to eat that. And nobody will diss your mother. 
So it's like a get out of jail free card. So the next time something disgusting comes across your plate, just say, my mother never taught me to eat this. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do with my mother. Anyway. So you're going to learn, learn new things. Speak, but speak to the questions that are asked. The other thing is try to disenfranchise your vocabulary. Theological vocabulary is extremely important in articulating our faith, but it doesn't always communicate well to people who don't have that same vocabulary. So be aware of that. Go forward in that. So let me touch briefly on the last one, and that's hospitality. Christine Pohl, who's a professor at Asbury, wrote a wonderful book, and the book is entitled Making Room, Recovering Hospitality as a Christian Tradition. She provides some historical roots and, and, and reasons for hospitality. But one of those in the early church was making yourself available to others so they could hear about the love of God. They could hear about the person of Christ. So hospitality becomes an important thing. Like my friend Carrie Graham, inviting people to her home. I have other friends that have done the same thing. In fact, my own daughter, my youngest daughter, Kirsty, and her husband. Her husband is an engineer, and my daughter did, did anthropology at university. And so they decided to start reaching out, and a lot of the engineers happened to be Turkish Muslims. And so my daughter went to the local market, which was a halal market, learned how to cook and prepare food that was acceptable in the uh, Muslim cuisine and that, that Muslims could eat without any problem. And she learned to do that. My son-in-law invited the engineers and their families back, and now my daughter and son-in-law have quite a robust conversation with some partners uh, about their faiths. And it's a wonderful opportunity wonderful opportunity of demonstrating love for the neighbor. Very practical. Cary Graham's is the second one. There's another one that's done, and this is one I think we ought to think about as a college. In L.A., we have a, we have a weekend retreat where we get uh, students from the seminaries in Los Angeles, the Hebrew seminary, some from, from an Islamic tradition, some from the liberal Protestant groups and evangelicals, and they get together and they talk about things for the weekend. It's sponsored by faculty, and the faculty engagement is quite a dynamic engagement. So I would, I would encourage thinking along those lines. Well, we could go on, and tomorrow I, <clears throat> I will. I'll touch on some of the specific things uh, when it comes to other faiths. But let me close with this. The Reverend Dr. David Penman was the Archbishop of the Church of England in Melbourne, Australia. He died in uh, 1989 about three weeks after coming back from Lausanne 2 in Manila. He was one of the plenary speakers at Lausanne 2, and he told a story which kind of encapsulates the kind of engagement. It seems that there was a sales conference in the center of the city, and a group of salespersons gathered during the day, and they all assured their spouses that they would be home by dinner. The meeting went late, as inevitably it would, and they were rushing for the train to get the commuter train, they picked up their tickets, and as they rushed through the turnstiles, they knocked over a small table that had a box of apples on it, and the apples spilled all over the ground. Of the five that were running together, four made it to the train, but one stayed back, but because as he turned around, he saw that some of the apples were bruised, and so he, he felt compelled to get, let the train go and begin to pick up the apples and replace them in the box, leaving a pile of bruised ones. And then he looked up to pay for the bruised ones, and he noticed that the seller of the apples was a 12-year-old boy who was blind. So he offered the money to the boy, and he said, I've knocked over your apples. I was completely thoughtless. I'm sorry I did that. I put them all back, the good ones. The bad ones are here, and I'm giving you $20, and that should cover the cost of the apples. I hope you have a good evening. And walked away. And as he walked away, the boy said, Mr., are you Jesus? Three weeks after that, saying that, he had a massive heart attack and died. It devastated us. We all had such respect for Dr. Penman. Melbourne, Australia is a very secular town. And everybody stopped, all the news channels, and everybody were paying attention to this righteous man who had died, all the religious communities as well as the very secular community. It was as if they were asking, David, are you Jesus? God calls us to this world to be a witness for Jesus. And sometimes the only thing that people see of Jesus is you. Don't be afraid to talk to others to do that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Bless my brothers and sisters. Keep them warm and safe. Help them to continue to learn and give us boldness as we witness for Christ in this world. 
For it's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.